By social disgust, we refer to things where there's an overwhelming consensus that these are beyond the pale, that these are extreme. Often we're referring to things like obscenity laws or things which are discussed like, the, for example, public de uh, depictions of executions by terrorist groups like ISIS, things like public nudity, things like very graphic pornography in public spaces. We're quite happy for this in robust democracies to be dictated by the courts, along quite possibly along the old maxim that you know the distinction between art and pornography is not something that's easy to specify, but you know it when you see it. Obviously, this applies to things that occur in public places. We're quite happy for Ashish to maintain his collection of dolphin pornography. Don't <laughs> ask him. Ask him after the round. We're quite happy for that to be the case. Um, so that's a model that's fairly simple, and we support the current existing nudity laws, obscenity laws, or in some cases where there is a particular history in those countries, things like hate speech laws that ban, for example, Nazi salutes and stuff like that. Um, the moment the minute goes, I'll ask any questions if you have them. We're going to talk about three things. First, I'm going to talk about what harm to accrue from, uh, from these actions of social disgust. Okay. Second, hold on a moment. Second, what public spaces are like. And third of all, about free speech and why it's not that important in this case. But for that, yes. Yeah. Could you just uh, clarify the verdict in courts? And does it set like, precedent for certain types of words or certain like forms of like uh, expression that you find when you're sharing? So I'm sure the courts will set precedents as they do. And as I said, again, I think it's something which courts quite reasonably already apply in you know most of Western Europe and in many other countries around the world. So I don't think that's a huge issue. But okay, PY number one now. Um, so first point about harms and what sorts of harms it causes, right? So in what ways does the social disgust and actions which could, like, you know, generate lots of social disgust lead to harm? So first of all, I think quite clearly, because they often that disgust is something that occurs in extremes and beyond the pale, these often to be th often happen to be things which also affect vulnerable populations, particularly. We are talking about survivors of sexual assault who may see in public depictions of very graphic pornography, may be forced to relive their experience. We see in graphic depictions of abortion in public areas and perhaps an anti-abortion campaign or something, the possibility for triggering or cause or for people to remember or relive this experience to see, as I said earlier, examples of ISIS we hit. What do you think that's Apart from the fact that people may be forced to relive particularly traumatic experiences as a result of these graphic depictions, which lead often lead to social disgust, the second reason is that very often social disgust arises from a violation of moral sensibility. And very often these moral sensibilities aren't just, I think it would be not good for you to portray this. They are, if I saw this being portrayed, then I myself have committed a sin. For example, for the fact that if you are a devout Christian and someone is portraying very graphic pornography or possibly gay pornography in a public square, it's quite possible that you will think that you have sinned and that you, uh, and that you are one step closer to hell for having seen that. And that's not something to rethink. Really Everything that sort of psychological trauma with some of the things that have become less of a person or a more evil person for that is tantamount to physical trauma. Why? First of all, I don't think it's a first of all, in the case where people are forced to relive terrible experiences in the past, I don't think there's a meaningful difference between freezing up or pa being paralyzed by that by the episode, from suffering episode, versus being physically restrained on a public street. I don't think anyone should have lived through that. But second of all, um, in terms of the moral sensibilities, that there isn't this thing that most of the harm people think about isn't just physical harm, but also the harm of how you view yourself in that identity as a person. I think that is very, very often undermined when they're forced to view these things which they think are immoral for them to view. Why is that particularly important? Or are these harms particularly important? Hold on a moment, in a public place. But before that, yes. Throughout history, the overwhelming consensus in democracies has often been that homosexuality is disgusting. Would you be okay with, for instance, public straight pornography that did not have that discussed, but not okay with homoerotic pornography? So generally, both kinds of public displays of pornography are banned for this very reason. But secondly, any society which is indeed very homophobic, yes, thanks for asking us to defend our side of the motion. Um, so why especially in public places? First of all, because you can't opt out of them. There's no way if I need to go on about my business to a public square, I can ever opt out of seeing this. This thing which makes me think that I am doing Satan's work, or this thing which will make me remind me of a terrible moment in my past and cause me to be <coughs> But second, the governments have a duty to make these spaces accessible. First of all, because they, they are set up and paid for using taxes which everyone pays into. But second of all, also because, as it were, governments have a duty to ensure that the most vulnerable in a society, those who are most likely to suffer as a result of like these depiction of these things that cause social disgust, are protected because, you know, in a state of nature, like the vulnerable are the ones who screwed, and governments have to defend them. And that is something which, and that people unavoidably cannot use it. So governments have to really make it accessible to everyone, and especially because people cannot opt out of using these if they want to live in our societies. I don't see why the, the desire of a few to, you know, say particular things or show particular things should outweigh people, other people's capacity to use these public spaces as and how they need to do so for their daily lives. Okay, finally, free speech. Several things about free speech. First of all, we think that, um, first of all, the point out that this, this happens with like very robust democracies. So I think this is unlikely to be the point where free speech with us on the vine, free political speech with us on the vine, precisely because there needs to be an overwhelming social consensus that this is a terrible thing before this policy even kicks into place. 
And by the second of all, I'll point out that to the extent that free speech is not an absolute inherent good, and it isn't, right? Because there's all sorts of regulations on when and where you can use speech. We don't like, you know, like the government doesn't pay for megaphones for you to get your speech out there. So clearly that's free speech isn't like an immediate or if free speech isn't inherent, right? It's something which we use to promote discourse and get the better ideas. But to the extent that these are actions that cause social disgust, disgust is unique in that it bypasses your capacity to have a rational, reasonable response to them. So they're not very conducive to discourse, right? That is to say, if your method of promoting discourse is by doing actions of disgust for uh, maybe the example is like depicting homosexual sex in a, in a homophobic society, then that doesn't get you very far because the natural res response of disgust uh, crowds out any capacity for reasoned discussion. So you don't really get listened to in that sense. But finally, we're quite happy for discussions of these norms to occur, right? That is to say that what is good in a democratic society is decided by what you know, the rest of society thinks as well. We say you operate within the you play by those rules of speech, and that's the only way in which you can have any sort of rational discussion. And again, this is partly because disgust, as I said, bypasses your capacity for rational speech. That is to say, it is very, very easy to shut down any desire for irrational, of people to use that public space for actually reason, discourse, or democratic speech if you can simply bypass and shut that down by committing access to social disgust. We see examples of this happening, right? In the Netherlands, the centrist parties faced a problem in, in the past election where no, fringe neo-Nazi groups would disrupt their, their rallies and everything and prevent people from listening and paying attention to those speeches, not by actually like drowning them out with words or anything, but by simply going up to the rallies and putting up very huge signs of Nazi-themed pornography. And sure, they're getting a message of the alt-right and Nazism right there, but that also impedes other people's capacity to use that public space for speech itself. Why? Precisely because acts of disgust and depictions of disgusting actors like that draw attention, bypass people's reasoning capacities, and they'll make it impossible for people to have reasoned discussions about things. So, actions that lead to social disgust, we think, should be restricted on public grounds, because they cause harm to people who can't opt out and can't afford them, because governments have a duty to uphold the rights of those people to use these public areas, but finally because they undermine free speech itself by preventing us from, re from having particular norms of discourse and advance the democratic debate. For these reasons, you need to go with opening government. For many conservative Muslims in the UK, Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, which attempts to reinterpret his own relationship with Islam and his own relationship with the Quran, was, of course, profoundly offensive because it dictated a different version of those stories to those with which they were familiar and which they were comfortable. And the reality is those people were disgusted and would consider themselves disgusted. And they would have been disgusted by any degree of discussion which presented a different religious perspective and a different religious interpretation from the one they personally agreed with or they personally pursued. In short, proposition is supported in a society which is necessarily majoritarianism, whereby strongly disagreeing with strongly held beliefs by a minority of the population or a majority of the population puts you out in the cold and unable to express those views. Well, you do, of course, have a debate of some description where, where, where that debate is sharply defined to things which everyone agrees in and breaking the consensus becomes a crime or breaking the consensus strongly becomes a crime. Two points in this speech. Firstly, where we think this is highly restrictive of expression. Secondly, where we think disgust should not be valued above What's expression. Right? Before that, some observations on what disgust is. In essence, disgust is just a feeling of very strong disapproval or, or, or disagreement. When you see pornography, which you think uh, you disagree with, you are, you, you're not, uh, you're, what you fundamentally think is that you think that is deeply wrong and that you, you therefore don't want that to be in your society. It differs fundamentally from something which makes you feel unsafe. Rather, it merely triggers an emotional response of disapproval, which is subjective to you personally, but which is broadly equivalent to an unpleasant feeling, uh, to other unpleasant feelings aroused by disagreement or nausea, or exists on a, uh, a spectrum of that as opposed to making you feel unsafe. So, for example, we think, uh, we, uh, uh, so what does that mean in terms of how this plays out? What does that mean in terms of how this plays out? Looking at the opening uh, of the government's case. So they observe that they are going to do this firstly by overwhelming consensus and secondly by courts. These are two mutually incompatible mechanisms because the courts are supposed to be presumably reading the overwhelming consensus, which is how do they do that? If they do have courts in the system, it presumably means the courts are making a judgment as to what disgust is reasonable. Given they never presented any reasons apart from, ah, oh, people find it disgusting and therefore it's bad, they ought to explain 
how and why they would premise some sorts of disgust above others, and if they are able to do that, why they are able to principally value disgust above the right of expression in a way which is insufficiently explained in their speech. But secondly, we would note that absolutely none of the examples they explained would be covered by the rules of overwhelming consensus. There is not an overwhelming consensus that there should be anti-abortion not that there should be anti-abortion protests. There is not an overwhelming consensus that there should be nudity. There is in fact an overwhelming consensus on no social issues whatsoever. So their motion appears to be proposing to do <laughs> precisely nothing. But what we think they're probably actually proposing is a small minority strongly objects to your behaviour and you are strong your opponents strongly disagree with you and they voice that vociferously in the society i.e. the ability of some people to freeze the status quo and to freeze a certain view of themselves. The other thing we would note is that they prevent any change from taking place. They say they're okay with discussion, but they also say that they're okay with okay with anything which people which people find disgusting being bad. We would note that mere discussion of tolerating homosexuality in some societies would be considered disgusting Why? and offensive, and therefore would, as they said themselves, admit it in response to our PYB perfect acceptable. Go for it. This debate is about public speech. So presumably the St. Mick verses can still be read in time. You need to defend public readings where people can't opt out in a similar way. So I think a bookshop is a public space. I think a TV forum where it's being discussed is a public space. I think all reasonable means of engagement are a public space. A university or a school, for example, is a public space. So perhaps you stand for a world where you can have free discussion in your cellar with your best friend, and then you're, you're like not allowed to bring those ideas outside of your home. That's not a really true and meaningful discussion in any sense, and it restricts those ideas. So firstly, why do we think this is highly restrictive of expression? We would note that disgust is primarily an emotional mode, as opposed to something being an attack on you, which is saying it doesn't have to be targeted to you personally. You don't personally have to see it. You don't have to be knowledgeable about it. It's merely you personally, in a subjective way, find it objectionable. Secondly, we would note that necessarily something one person finds disgusting is going to be important to someone else. Why? Because it's something which is, arouses strong emotions, whether it is discussion of religion, whether it is pornography, whether it is uh, important associations like abortion or sexual rights. The result of this is that you have, a you have a large number of objections because what disgust is is not related to whether it's proximate to you, and at the same time all of those objections concern things which are important to other people. Opening government's models strongly imply they will be happy with shutting down all of those things, or at least shutting down the majority of them, or the ways they could be expressed in. No, thank you. We would note three reasons why we think there is likely to become an increasing trajectory towards banning an increasing number of things as disgusting or unacceptable. For instance, political views on either the extreme or either the kind of moderately extreme right or the moderate extreme left, or for example, discussion of religion. We think that so the reason the reason being that it's, it's profoundly subjected to you personally, and they have not described any mechanism for deciding whether or not that is a legitimate source of disgust. I you say you feel disgusted 100 percent great, you're disgusted 100 percent And if there are enough of you, presumably you then ban it. The second effect of that is you then have an enormous incentive to register yourself as disgusted, to say you are feeling this emotion. When we consider firstly, there is no way of verifying whether your disgust is quote unquote genuine. And secondly, that there is uh, so secondly, that uh, you have a strong incentive what to feel definition? emotions you are being told you should feel. This leads to an increasing number of people finding an increasing number of things disgusting, especially when they aren't used to those ideas being tolerated at all in society because they've been banned. And therefore, so the margin of what they fi don't find disgusting gets narrower and narrower. Go for it. So there isn't an overwhelming consensus on porn, but there is a very large one on whether you should blast it in a public street. Precisely because ideas are not disgusting often, but it's the depiction or the portrayal of that. It's why discourse can still happen without leading to the outputs of destroying very disgusting. Firstly, they think it's deeply disputable whether there is, should be bans on erotic imagery in streets. If you look at the Netherlands, it's all over the place. Secondly, we would say that those consensus move, and we see no reason to presume that the current consensus is correct. I. In, some, in the Netherlands, they have porn everywhere. In the US, they have porn nowhere. Why is that necessarily the correct decision for that society? And why shouldn't we allow people to make their own choices about what that should be and what they wish to consume and demand by a process of evolving change as opposed to freezing the status quo and what they currently find disgusting and desirable? Secondly, in terms of why we think disgust shouldn't be prioritized over free speech, look, the relative effect of me being disgusted is basically not that bad. I think this is something I strongly disapprove of. I wish it wasn't in society, but it isn't fundamentally different from other themes of disapproval, or from me seeing something nauseous like sick on the street, <coughs> which, which I also like feel a sense of revulsion towards. By contrast, the person who can't express their beliefs, discuss their view of religion, 
or put across a political opinion or doesn't have access to other people doing so, that shuts down something which is, because it's disgusting to someone else, almost definitely important to them, and which, they, and which is part of their self-expression and their view of themselves. Very proud to oppose. <laughs> Let's go for the remarks, somebody, Deputy Prime Minister. You're here. worsens attitudes towards the groups that they want to advance, such as LGBT rights, and secondly, that the capability of democratic governments to modulate the extent to which these value trade-offs that are being discussed in the front half should happen. Before then, let's deal with some of what they tell us. So you just get to this bizarre straw man that like, any sort of discussion about particular things could invoke disgust, right? But I think that Juan's POI quite reasonably dealt with this by demonstrating that there is a very, very profound difference between mere disapproval and not agreeing with something and disgust, right? For instance, like most of us probably like disapprove of what ISIS does, right? But I think that is very, very like qualitatively different from like the revulsion and like disgust that you feel when you actually watch the, a video of them beheading an individual, right? They claim that it's impossible to just adjudicate and you could just assert that things disgust you, right? Like clearly it's the case that courts can adjudicate things like this that are reasonable, right? Courts can adjudicate whether people hold religious values in good faith or if they're just attempting to like say and lie about these things in order to like get religious exemptions, right? Here's how the courts versus public consensus thing is resolved, right? It's not a tension at all because what courts do is that they often gauge what the public opinion and perception of things are in terms of making the decisions, right? And they can also do things like weigh the different relative importance of the discursive value of the thing that is potentially being censored against the amount of disgust that is actually felt, right? And more importantly, there often does exist like very important exemptions for things such as artistic art, you know, as well as like political discussion, right? So it, it, we think that their characterization that like, you know, this society is just going to be one where tons of views are censored and dominated by majoritarianism just doesn't apply given the way that courts Sir, operate. Sure. Who tends to A, be judges and B, have better access to, to lawyers and like the legal systems at large? Majorities who are wealthy and supplies or minorities? So, like, here's the problem, right? Like, they're going to give you a bunch of examples of, like, minority groups being oppressed. We're going to give you examples of, like, you know, Nazi ideas being censored. Like, clearly, these arguments are fairly hyperbolic in both directions and symmetrical, right? What I'm going to do for you is demonstrate that, how these trade-offs can be adjudicated in a reasonable way, as well as, like, why what they do worsens things, right? Let's next, next talk about public spaces, right? Because I think that this, again, like, they just don't seem to understand the concept of things like bookshops are obviously, like, private spaces owned by private individuals, and they can choose what to display there. The like commerce and the importance are like public areas, right? Like courtyards, like roads, and clearly there exist currently lots of rules as to like why individuals can't like crowd out public space and ensure that other people can't access or engage with them, right? It's like illegal for me to park my car in the middle of the road because that's a public good that everyone needs to access. Likewise, we suggest that like, you know, putting up billboards of things that people would find revolting, like blocks them out from being able to access public spaces and worsens speech and discourse. All right. Next thing they talk about is about the restriction to discourse that happens, right? So I already dealt with the fact that you can't tell, but also just that like, None of the things that they are talking about that like actually constitute what this motion is about meaningfully contribute to discourse, right? As Quan articulated, discussions of things like abortion in public spaces never invoke disgust merely in and of themselves. It's things like really, really graphic depictions of things like fetuses being aborted. That is what we're talking about. So it doesn't like block out any sort of like meaningful discourse or discussion. Instead, what happens is that you block out the things that prevent your opponents from being able to engage you with you in that discussion, and we think we get more discourse, right? Next, and finally on speech, which is the final things you present, right? Look, we restrict individual rights, speech being one of them, on the basis that if you harm someone physically, then you no longer have the ability to access those rights, right? Like, I can't punch Quan in the face because that would violate his bodily autonomy and his, like, like, 
physical sense of self, right? Our claim is that emotional harm and damage that is caused by really disgusting images, things that potentially trigger panic attacks and anxiety within individuals, or just things that cause them like huge amounts of harm are no qualitatively different from any sort of physical harms that would be caused. And clearly it's the case that we're fine with restricting individual liberties when they cause physical harm. We say those emotional harm is no different, and we would also be fine with restricting individual rights in that capacity. No thanks. All right. Firstly, then, on why they actually worsen attitudes, right? Presumably, they're defending a world in which no obscenity laws exist, right? Where all ideas are able to be displayed and, like, publicly displayed, right? Here's why we think that is actually problematic, right? We suggest that, like, as social trends continue to develop, things such as acceptance of homosexuality within society gradually improves over time, right? That's to say, like, the 1950s were much, much more homophobic than they are today. Perhaps in that society, the vast, vast majority of people would find, like, you know, two men kissing to be incredibly disgusting, whereas that's clearly not the case today in the status quo. But the problem is that when you enable all of these things to be displayed in public spaces and, like, or, like there's no restrictions, what happens is that because that uh, incentives that exist for news corporations, for like things to be prominent, will always result in the worst things being displayed, and this actually harms the rights of those that they want to protect. Right? That's to say, for instance, we think like media, like Fox News, is likely to pick up on the most egregious and harmful instances in which these there are public displays of things such as homosexuality, and thus, like this worsens social attitudes because individuals might be tolerant of certain things, but they wouldn't be tolerant of the most extreme things that invoke the most amount of disgust and outrage among them. Uh, sure, but the problem is that only these things are displayed in their society. Sure. So some conservatives consider minarets disgusting symbols of Islamization. Muslims might feel that people protesting against that were symbols of disgusting Islamophobia. Who's illegal? Both minarets and people protesting against them? Um, probably neither, since neither of those things fall under what our definition of like overwhelming social consensus is, right? So they worsen attitudes on their side of the house by only allowing the most repulsive things to gain prominence, which the vast majority of society at that time disagrees with, and that trickles down to them disagreeing with homosexuality writ large. Finally, on the capability of democratic governments to modulate the discourse, right? Clearly it's the case that the Netherlands is much more like sexually open, but there still exists obscenity laws in terms of other things, right? For instance, Nazi I Iconography. And this argument is merely to say that individual societies can determine within themselves what they find to be disgusting or not disgusting, as well as how to trade off the rights of individual free speech and autonomy, as well as social collective benefits and utility, right? We aren't asserting that any one of these things is much more important. We are asserting that both of these things have value, but uniquely on their side of the house, they are saying that individual autonomy to self-express must trump the rest of society's right to like utility and to have the society that they want in all instances. We say allow the courts to make that adjudication. They often make the correct one that both of these things are valuable, but only our side of the house respects the value in both of those things. We propose. Here, here. Here's your remarks and invite the deputy leader of the opposition here. here. of countries that do not have these laws, you do not see incredibly graphic and hurtful and triggering material in the vast majority of cases. And that's for the reason that people do not often invest their resources on buying up billboards in spending that time unless they think that speech is useful and, and useful to usually a substantial portion of people that agree with them. And that meant that by opening government, trying to shirk away from cases like the satanic verses, trying to shirk away from cases where there was not a consensus of literally 100%, they were unable to prop anything meaningful in this debate. How am I going to structure this speech? I'm firstly going to talk to you about how speech might be useful generally to other people, particularly in the context of a democratic society, weighing up potential benefits to political discourse against the harms that might have. And secondly, talk about to the individual that's making that speech why it's independent of any of the kind of harms or benefits opening government wanted to weigh on the scales, something that we should care about. So firstly, to the public. 
Opening government makes two essential claims here that I'm going to break down for you. The first is that it hurts particular vulnerable people that might view that speech, and the second is that it stifles political progress. To the first of these. The first observation we make about the government case so far is that they've really been failed to be pinned down by Rafi's questioning, just, just because they have evaded it so much on how people are actually hurt by this kind of speech. But lots of the things that they wanted to talk about are covered by other laws. For instance, we would be fine with people being nude, and sexual intimidation while someone is nude is still something that we'd like them to see as illegal under all kinds of other sexual assault laws. No, the mere feeling of nausea or, 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 or feeling of, of repulsion or dislike of someone else's ideas and something that is important to them is different and distinct from feeling like something is an assault on you. But the second thing to say here okay. is there's a huge trade-off that they recognise when they tell you that things like books and television that might have kinds of social utility, the things that they wanted to call private, when they tell you that despite all of their arguments about people having the potential to feel disgust, they wouldn't care about those things. And that's just to say that we think people experience, no, the same kinds of inner repulsion, for instance, when they read things like the satanic verses, as they might when they see someone nude on a billboard. And that's something that the government should care about, particularly in closing half. The second broad thrust here was that the, there's something politically unuseful and in fact unproductive is, is the claim they wanted to make about this kind of speech. The first observation to make here is, is in opening opposition, no, we reject the premise that speech should only be protected if it advances some particular goal. Imagine, for instance, and it's hard for a lot of us in this room, no, that there is a God and that God, no, thinks abortion is wrong. You don't even need religion, guys. You could also say, scientifically, let's imagine, for instance, that we proved that life began at conception. In that world, even if everyone around you, and there's overwhelming consensus that pictures of fetuses is something that is disgusting, I think picketing abortion clinics in the context of a genocide in the eyes of, of like a, a objective god or a objective science is something that you should be able to do and something that would ha is morally right. The second thing to say here is that often the kinds of speech they're talking about no are in fact useful for political discussions. There are some important messages that require disgust. For instance, the horrors of a war in Syria are so far away and might be useful to be confronted by that particular reality when you see a land like literally on, 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 literally on a beach, you might be more likely to do something about that. But secondly, as we told you, that consensus is liable to change. No, you should be con confronted with things that might allow you to change your view on it. No, thank you. The, th the third thing to say here is that we think the issues have become more likely to be confused. Because opening government's claim here is that you can't look past the disgust, so that disgust becomes the nexus of the argument and you're unlikely to have productive discussion. In their world, we think you have a much more centralised nexus when you have literally court proceedings, I'll take you in a minute, that are being argued over for explaining that closing. So biometric of individual utility, you'd presumably also be okay with a person sitting across you on the subway and masturbating? I mean, you have to weigh those up, and for all the reasons we gave you, I mean, we don't think masturbation is something that's wrong. We think a democratic society can make its like, like, sh should not be the one to, to judge that. Particularly when you put anything that you find socially acceptable or liberal today, and put that in the context of 30 or 40 years ago, or 100 years ago, when that might have had the same level of social disgust, we don't think people, or other people, particularly anyone in this room is in any position to make that call. So, even if that was true, why does illegalizing that behavior confuse that conversation so much more? That's because you, firstly, confuse like the free speech libertarian crowd that are unlikely to actually be interrogating the issues and are more likely to be taking a side simply because they think the court's so intervening. Take you in maybe about 30 seconds. But the second thing to say is the focus for anyone on either side of that argument becomes proving a threshold of disgust to the courts, not proving through a reasoned discussion that something is right or wrong, that something is, is good or bad for other people, that someone should or should not be doing that behaviour for, 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 for any reason that is at least understandable to all and not just those that feel disgust. Yeah. So every single democracy still has obscenity laws. They have nonetheless become more socially progressive because they can weigh up for themselves, which is more important for each instance, social disgust and preventing that, or maybe the utility of a discussion. You guys don't let them weigh up social disgust at all. Uh, look, we posit that in the absence of those obscenity laws, that threshold would have happened faster, or at least more rapidly, and say that in the current context, when you're looking at exactly the kinds of examples you talked about, for instance, 
the abortion lobby, you're more likely to get productive discussion if you allow people to say something that is so important to them. And the final observation to make on this point is that it, kind of running off the answer to that point of information, often people require or feel that they require the use of that because the moral claim on them to, to use that kind of speech is so important. In the absence of being able to pull out pictures of fetuses, for instance, you're more likely to do things like invoke religion that can't be understood by the other 60% of the population. You're more likely to become more radicalised and, and, and in seeing a population that is overwhelmingly against you, less likely to engage, more likely to do things like shoot up abortion clinics. Secondly, looking beyond the level of public discourse and to the individual. The first thing to say here is that often, because of the investment that person is making that, you're more likely to see things that, or at least we should have some epistemic humility about that person investing their time and thinking it's useful compared to people who can easily just claim disgust when it has little cost to them. But the second thing to say here is we think there's a democratic responsibility, regardless, to treat each people equally. As I pointed to in a point of information, we just don't accept that you should treat people who are gay differently from people who are straight. But lastly, the enforcement is likely to be overly conservative in ways that hurt those individuals. Let's hear from the Marks and invite the member of government to us back after the round. Here. accounted for in this debate is that there is a reason we actually excessively regulate public spaces even if it's not for social disgust purposes, right? So for example, we don't allow you to play loudspeakers in public after a particular point in the night because a lot of people feel very uncomfortable and would like to sleep instead. That's a public space where you want to express yourself by playing whatever music you want to play, but it does have the ability of other people to be able to sleep at night and have some form of comfort. This is not related to social disgust, but it means that you do try to make public spaces as comfortable as you can for a majority of people who live in that state. So what I'm going to do first is going to explain to you why the only way to judge what, what is acceptable or not acceptable in a public space is through a democratic process. And secondly, I'm going to talk to you about why the best way to make things more acceptable in the public space is also through the democratic process. And I'll deal directly with opening opposition while I do these things. Firstly, on opening opposition, on this whole idea of like there's a difference between disgust and disapproval and expression is more important. I think they make a false comparative between expression and like disgust and disapproval. Right? We think often what like your ability to express yourself does is harm others' ability to express themselves in public spaces as well. What does that mean? We think, for example, when we ask them the POI about what, what how do you differentiate between sex like intimidation and expression when somebody is sitting across the subway and masturbating, right? They said, oh, we can adjudge that. But the point of this debate is that you have to be able to adjudge that and the only legitimate way to adjudge that uh, we will posit is through a democratic process which means that because you as an individual seeing someone masturbate in front of you in the subway might feel extremely uncomfortable with that person masturbating but that could also be their form of personal expression of like their sexual expression it's very tough to judge whether that expression is more important than your, the harm to you one but secondly your ability to be comfortable and like, like, like talk to the person next to you in the subway or your ability to, to, to access the subway in the first place like your ability to express yourself in public your ability to go out in public and like just have conversation with other people on the subway is extremely determined by the ability of other people to express themselves in that public space as well. Which means you can't draw this distinction between like you know having disapproval and having expression because we think often like it's very directly in the name. The only thing opening opposition says to this is that oh people don't actually put up really offensive stuff in public so it's, even if it's fine. I think firstly, catcalling is something that happens a lot in public spaces. People's ability to express themselves in public and say that a woman is really pretty is harassment for another woman. Right? Her ability to express herself and wear shorter clothes is harmed by the ability of this person to express himself and say that a woman looks really hot in a public sphere. Which is why we often, in a lot of democratic states, try and ban things like catcalling because that person's expression harms the other individual's expression. Which means 
you can't say that like you have to prioritize a vague expression over other people's feelings of disgust. And why are democracies the best way to judge, or like to make these lines of disgust? The first thing to say is that, like uh, as I said, uh, noted in my opening. We think public spaces are spaces where most people should be comfortable accessing, right? Which means that public spaces like should be determined in terms of what most people are okay with. In a democracy, you never have any policy which everybody is okay with, uh, with like uh, abiding by, right? We think like often you won't have the precedent you want, you won't have the kinds of laws you want, you won't have the welfare you want, right? It means democracies always make the trade-off of the like who you want to prioritize based on what most people want. And given in a public space, you can't determine what is offensive and what is it's like your legitimate form of expression. That's what we think it's legitimate for public space for most people to decide that this is offensive to us and that's why we should ban it as opposed to prioritize certain individuals' expression which harms the ability of other individuals to express themselves. The only way to resolve this clash is to have what most people think is comfortable. Note that people can still express themselves in private spheres, which means people can still masturbate back in their homes. People can still like, like watch pornography back in their house. We're not curtailing a massive amount of freedom. We're just making public spaces more accessible to everybody. Before I move on, I'd like to Freedom of speech exists so that minorities who may not have access to any other lever of power are able to ensure that their views are heard and to ensure that they are visible. Why do you think that on this last bastion of minority control that it should be turned over to complete mob rule? We don't think, like in most democratic societies, people have laws protecting freedom of speech because people value freedom of speech for a lot of individuals. Do not show why that falls on your side in this debate. I'm going to secondly talk to you about why it's better that these legitimate things that are currently banned, like what our opposition want to talk about, be accepted through the democratic process as opposed to having a world where that like, you just are okay with all kinds of laws and then you no know, people don't have any recourse to protect themselves from that. So let, like, let's take the best case example in our opposition. Right? Things like breastfeeding, for example, which they would, which people find disgusting, but it's actually a form of personal expression for a lot of them. We think democracies are able to liberalize in a few ways with respect to these things. We think to the extent that there's a large degree of utility to breastfeeding in public. So for example, if you're a long train ride or long bus ride, we think women have a large degree of need to breastfeed their children in public. Which means you can often explain to the majority that a lot of women require this and it's important for them to be able to breastfeed their children in public. The second thing you do is that you often have enough mass of people, or like a lot of women, who understand that they might want to breastfeed their child in public and provide it nutrition while they're traveling or while they're out in public spaces. Right? Which means you often, I'll take a point. So when this, when your motion is that women will not be able to go out in public without covering their, covering their hair, or trans people not going out in public at all, why do you prioritize a minority of people's, uh, why do you deprioritize a minority of people's ability to express themselves at all over the majority feeling marginally more comfortable? Okay, so if it's such a society that is so conservative that transgender people can't go out at all, I'm getting to that in my this argument, it's much better to have like, tra like trans people accepted through democratic process. Firstly, we don't know how you're going to like uh, like ban them from accessing the public space in the first place. They didn't show us how. We think the, the best way to have acceptance of minorities in public spaces is through uh, like allowing forms of expression through the democratic process. How is that? So for example, like we think it would be like interracial couples when they were looked down upon in previous years. We think it would be really bad to show to have them having sex in public on the subway as opposed to them like being together on the subway that was something that was accepted. Right? I think the point of which they had sex in public where people would be much less okay with this. It happened in Poland when you had like a wave of liberalization after the uh, after party was accepted but they were voted out in the next election because people weren't okay with that forced liberalization down their throat. We think often these things are reversed when they're not done to legitimate democratic process. We're very proud to propose. Here, here. here for the remarks. So, uh, invite the member of opposition to open up the op case. Here, here. One second. 
So basically what this debate has boiled down to so far is on their side, like, we should try and stop Nazi depressing people, and on our side, we should like, let gay people speak. What we're going to show you uniquely in closing opposition is why people who are from entrenched power structures are always going to be able to enforce laws disproportionately so that minorities are like discriminated against under these laws. We're then going to explain why we think that we should privilege minorities over the majorities. All of my mental battle would be in this um, But firstly, one bit, bit extra, but like, very, very much. So open government comes out and they tell you that we need to protect people from their emotional trauma. But first, they don't believe we should protect all people from their triggers all the time. Like, unless you're going to ban loud noises and thus try and protect veterans from triggered by gunshots, we recognize that you can't eliminate people's emotional triggers, nor should we try to. So what is the bar and the bright line where we should protect people from their emotional traumas? We think it is when, like, um, we should protect, um, we think that the line should be drawn when it infringes people's ability to live, like, a certain quality of life. At that point, it is, uh, it is at the point where it infringes people's ability to live a quality of life, as, like, banning loud noises would, we think it is fine to let people suffer some sort of emotional trauma, given that other people can have some vague access to standard living. So we think in order to prove that, like, against opening up this opening government's capitalization of why, um, this is bad. We need to prove that like morality um, impedes people's ability to like live um, normally. Then the second capitalization we give out get out of closing um, government is that like um, how firstly this, this respectability politics idea that like minorities should be more respected if you like, they, like start nicely at first, and secondly they had this idea that um, like the best way to do this is to be done democratically. We're going to pass this right now. Okay, so firstly we think that like the way that conservatives. Conservative groups were able to um, exert a disproportionate influence over society, irrespective of how much they were presented democratically. Why is this? The KKK is an ancient organization. It's existed for like many, many years. It is very infamous, and it has like a lot of money and a lot of story backers, right? The base already exists. We think, therefore, it's able to like, put money into lawyers. Judges tend to be older, whiter, more conservative, more like the court case and more persuasive. Let's compare this to Black Lives Matter, which is firstly a new movement, does not have lots of money, it's composed of people who like, are from a smaller socioeconomic background. This, um, definition means they're less able to access the court system, and thus they're probably less able to get their discussed laws passed than the Nazis on your side of the house. What this means is the way the court system and the resources these people have is set up is such that it privileges of information. more wealthy and um, privileged groups. Sure. So minorities don't advance their cause by disgust, because as Harry said, that makes them look extreme. Conservatives use disgusting things to disrupt public speech, often to hurt minorities. See so the example of my attempted Nazi okay, bill so in the Netherlands. Credit where it's due to opening opposition. What they pointed out, and you never really responded to, is that in some societies, gay people kissing is considered an extreme form of speech. Recognize that, like, what. The, but that what disgust is is likely to be like incredibly narrow, and like the ideas that you consider respectable, such as like two people, like a black and white person holding hands on the tube, often weren't at one point. If you buy our analysis to so these people having better access to the legal system, you get even these more progressive, these more gentle and respectful things outlawed. Conservative groups have an incentive to do this because they do not want these groups to become more acceptable and more normalised. They have an incentive to push the hardest policies because that best protects their position. They also have the resources to do this, right? So what we think this means is that we think that more conservative, more wealthy groups are able to monopolize these laws disproportionately, even if they're not the majority. Okay, now, next step. Even if these people are the majority, even if you've got majority conservative in society, why should we privilege minority voices? Because recognize minority voices have no other avenue um, but discuss to try and rally people around them or to otherwise draw attention to their causes. Recognize that, like, discuss or put, um, um, or like controversial provoking images is often the only way for people to draw attention to their actions and it's often the only way um, to rally. This is particularly true about like new movements, which a lot of people wouldn't have heard before, right? So even for stuff like um, transgender movement, which enters the public eye very, very late, it's only through provocative or loud images that you draw the sort of attention that you need to build any sort of political capital and to get any sort of attention, right? We do not think there was a way to do this tamely. First, because the existence of a transgender person is quite controversial. But second, if you want to rally your group and you want to build any sort of like broad based support base across the country, you necessarily need to project a loud or um, noticeable image which is likely to attract attention. We think loud noticeable images are likely to attract, are likely to be thought of disgusting. Firstly, because like necessarily in order to provoke a lot of attention, it has to be somewhat controversial. But secondly, because if you are a conservative group who wants to intentional um, leaders of power, you have every incentive to cut back against anything that could be useful for rallying or could attract a lot of attention. This includes those sort of controversial images. This means that if a conservative group thinks that an image is likely to attract a lot of attention, even if it's not disgusting, they have the incentives to advocate for the sort of like regressive or disgust policies. You can now cause apply a lot of opening opposition analysis to how like you can't prove disgust. It's quite easy to like weight that in the court system. I'll take that part. Individuals can still do what they want in private. Why is gay people having the freedom to kiss in public more important compared to democracies creating spaces where because most how people else are not? Because they ever going to rally people's their cause? How else are they ever going to attract attention to the sort of social movement they need to achieve democratic change? Recognize that democratic change is contingent on having a sufficient majority of people or a large enough movement that you can ever affect the political system. If people are never allowed to rally and never allowed to attract attention to the they cannot exercise change democratically. That's the comparison you have on their side of the house. So why do we think that this is, so we think that it's like probably pretty clear it's better for minorities who are going to be oppressed and they're allowed to like express their views. Why do we think it's actually better for the majority society as a whole? Okay, so recognize that like the majority of people in like 
um, Democratic societies aren't necessarily like bigots so much as they like they are like relatively uninformed, right? We give like people often haven't heard like very specific like um, gender pronouns. They haven't heard of, like very specific sorts of um, movements, right? We don't think these people necessarily be adverse. We don't think they attract attention. As I told you, we think what this um, discussed, you know, like controversial images, like uniquely does, is allow them to attract sort of attention, which notifies the general public or increases the awareness of the general public writ large about these images. Yes, we're willing to bite the bullet that there will be some conservative blowback. There will also be liberal blowback, or there will also be a degree of people who like, support this image, or who like, are willing to come out and speak publicly in favour of the controversial um, minority image. What we think this does is attract more attention to the cause. This is good for two reasons. First, because like, recognize that like, if you're a gay person, or like, if you're a trans person living in like, a tiny town in rural Western or a tiny town in Alabama, it's probably reassuring you good and like, will enable you to live your good life to know that there are a ton of lifestyles out there that you might be attracted to, right? We think the only way they're ever going to get informed is through controversial thought provoking images. The second we think it's probably good for the minority movements because it allows them to rally the majority to their side. But that, like, if you're a white person or if you like live, like if you're not ex if you do not interact with people that you know to be out or LGBT or say or any other minority group, you don't really have an incentive to engage in that sort of political dialogue and that political discourse because that issue never affects you and you're not really aware of it. Like a lot of white women aren't particularly aware of like issues around black hair, right? We think the only way you can attract attention or you expose them to these ideas is um, through like loud imagery given that it's not going to be exposed um, anywhere else. We think that like so the, the final, we, we think, I mean, finally, we think this is the only way this change ever happens, right? First, because it's the only way that you ever get the awareness or the like national consensus around it. Um, so, um, secondly, we, because we think that like when you radicalise people, um, as we think is going to happen, because people are going to feel shut down, and because we think conservatives are going to get increasingly more laws passed, we think what happens then people are less willing to work together, right? Because if you fundamentally attack like people are opposed to your way of life, you're really less willing to cooperate with the democratic. You're probably, probably like you take more extreme actions, which are increasingly polarisation. Polarizing, we think that fragments society fundamentally. Ladies and gentlemen, all this law does is discriminate against statistically unlikely trauma, statistically unlikely more, uh, um, more beliefs. We know that by controversial images, the only way to rally is sufficient support to ever change things democratically or very proud to oppose. And I invite the uh, government whip to finish off the good case here. to say that if at this point in time, instead of speaking, I started stripping down and masturbating, everybody in this room would be disgusted by it. I'm going to tell you over the next seven minutes why that is a legitimate reaction and why if you have the ability to vote and not allow me to do that, that is also perfectly fair and something that should in fact happen in democratic societies. Right? I'm going to ask two questions in my speech. First, what is the standard for regulating public spaces? And secondly, why do democratic means give us the best way to determine these regulations? But before that, respond to the closing opposition extension on minorities and their speech, right? Three like points of response. Firstly, it was unclear in their extension speech as to why disgust is essentially the currency that minorities are going to use to further their cause of social progress, right? Which means, like, there are no examples to prove why is it that their case was applicable to these minorities that they're talking about, right? But secondly, and this is something that even opening asks for POI, POI oh, what about, like, societies that don't like gay people or trans people? Presumably, on Gov, we're not okay with, like, banning entire facets of identity, right? Like for example, we're probably not okay with like people banning you being gay or you being trans, right? We think that's something that we don't have to stand by in this yes, right? Perhaps like what is more reasonable is things that are disgusting. So for instance, we're not okay with a naked trans person, right? We think that is the distinction that is important to make, right? But thirdly, even if we do accept that that is the case and that this is in some magical world a reasonable way to get attention and further your social cause, we would suggest from closing government that the better way to do it is democratically, right? Which means, for example, if you fight for things like equal rights for gay people, for example, the, the ability to marry, we think that social acceptance comes hand in hand with that, which means if you fight for gay marriage, 
marriage, you will also then be able to have gay people kissing in public, right? We think that the problem with that extension from closing off is that it assumes a favorable reaction on the part of people who are being subjected to this form of speech, right? We think it's equally likely on that side of the house that they might also open themselves up to things like violence or backlash in the instance that most people in that public space do not like that form of expression, right? We think it is only when it goes through a democratic means can you be sure that this is in fact accepted and we'd much rather that minorities only acted upon these forms of expression in that instance, right? But more on that in my speech. First, what is the standard for regulating public spaces, right? Opening tells us that the perhaps like the standard should be like immense harm or trauma or triggers, right? We expand the scope of this debate from closing by telling you that the like, like very often regulations have a much lower bar when we talk about public spaces, right? Things like loudspeakers, etc like aren't allowed in public spaces simply because it makes a lot of people yeah. uncomfortable simply because it is an inconvenience to most people, right? Why is it that demo like democracy is able to judge this in the best possible way, right? Simply the fact that like you have numbers on your side, right? Which means you can at least ensure that most people are comfortable on your side of the house given that they were never able to adjudicate which form of expression was more important on that side of the house, right? Opening opposition tells us that, oh, you can't really distinguish between public and private. I don't know, bookshops and universities somehow like don't fall on our side of this debate, right? Look, if you can reasonably ensure that people have an ability to opt in, then we would suggest that it is okay to have speech in those particular instances, right? Which means if you're able to have trigger warnings, or for example, if you're able to just go out and buy the satanic verses for God's sake, is when you do opt in to reading that particular book, which is why we're open okay with that form of speech existing in that particular form, right? But secondly, on, on like the utility that they try to prove of this speech, right? Notice that opening opposition were never really, really able to prove why this sort of speech in public is going to be uniquely valuable, right? Because all of their discussions on like religion and politics, etc., can in fact happen in regulated environments such as university classrooms or libraries or bookstores, what have you, right? It was unclear as to why this necessarily needed to be forced down the throats of people in public when they never consent consented to accepting this form of speech yeah. at all, right? So what have I proved here at the end of this? We've showed you that there is in fact there exists a like reasonable bar for regulating public spaces and like comfort and convenience ascertained through democratic means meets that bar, right? Before I move on and talk to you about why demo democracy is the best way to get change, I think open. Your extension is that if the public are conditioned in the right way, they might be receptive to arguments about nutrition when deciding about something like breastfeeding. Our contention was that the rights of mothers or babies should not be held responsible to that decision, particularly in the context of democracy demanding an equality between people. Will you respond to this? Right, right. Which, which brings me to the bit on defending democracy, right? Look. We need to, like, at some level, have some sort of faith in our institutions and the ability of democracy to be able to adjudicate upon these things sensibly, right? Which means, if there is, in fact, like, such a great degree of utility to breastfeeding in public, we think it should be fairly straightforward to be able to talk to people about that utility in and of itself, right? We think people do, in fact, tend to agree to that, right? Why is that the case? Because here's the thing about democratic checks, right? You need to convince people, right? Which means you need to talk to them, you need to be able to have these forms of discussions, which means openings contentions that it's very hard to get consensus doesn't really stand in this particular debate, right? Because once you have enough people like to support you, is the point in which we think a lot of these freedoms that they want on that side of the house can be guaranteed far, far better, right? Which means that if you in fact do go through democratic means, and this is like just like uh, like by the way, better than the stuff that on courts that opening says, is when you can ascertain that you do have Lots the critical of mass of people that are able to provide you okay go go ahead gay people can just express their affection in private homophobes can just not go for their evening walk why is a homophobe's right to have their evening walk in their preferred state of mind more important than gay people's rights not to, to express their affection look here's the thing right it's unclear like through your speeches why it was in fact that the gay people that person right that needs to be valued more we would contend that if there are so many homophobic people like literally like 10,000 to 1 perhaps you should spend some time convincing them before you go ahead and do these things in public so sure some degree of utility is lost but we think that on the comparative it's far far better if you have the majority on your side right why is that the case 
two reasons. Firstly, we think that on our side of the house, you're able to have much better legal checks, which means that if you have, like, through democratic mandate, like, you have things codified, such as equal rights for gay people, we think in those instances, if homophobic homophobes act on those tendencies, we can actually hold them accountable and make sure that they aren't able to, like, harm these individuals who they hate, right? But secondly, we think it's only on our side of the house can you be sure that you have allies who are going to protect you in public spaces at the point at which your ability to express yourself was harmed. Because they were never sure of providing the protection to the people they so wanted to protect and we gave you a mechanism to do exactly that. We're very, very proud of you. Mr. Flermont to invite the opposite to finish up here. check on basic rights be democratic and not address Bobby telling you why access to those tools are not equal. Maybe you take their philosophical grounding that we should just adjudicate everyone's claims fairly as persuasive, but then they would have had to have responded to why it's not the case that there are structural advantages for some groups to be able to access those democratic tools to shut down other types of viewpoints. And it is not the case that everyone has that same ability to ensure that they are protected from some degree of disgusting speech. So given that framework now that we have, which is that this is not an equal access, we, see, we say that opposition, and hopefully specifically closing opposition, has taken this debate. Let's do a bit of weighing about what happens in these public spaces. I think Rafi's POI was excellent here. We say that the harms to a viewer in public is A, short term, and B, changes over time. That is to say that from the 1920s until now, the way that someone views gay people holding hands has dramatically changed. The way that maybe Mormons would see black people expressing their religion in pews has dramatically changed. Which is to say that the harms that are expressed by the entire government bench as far as discomfort are in a small temporal time slice. But we say that the fact that you can entrench the ability for people to not be able to express themselves okay. takes a group of people and structurally keeps them out of society for literally perpetually because they no longer have tools. What tools are we talking about? Bobby explains to you why for many groups the ability to just literally exist can be disgusting to others. Recognize that for some people the trans identity is disgusting. Walking outdoors in clothes that don't fit the gender you were assigned is disgusting. Your life is a political expression, although you did not choose for it to be one. We say that those individuals have a right to be able to walk out onto the street and that they are structurally prevented from doing so. The conception we get that started from open government and was developed by closing government that tries to do work with this is all. But now will we, incent we will incentivize minorities to do the right thing and just have productive conversations. Even if we ignore the paternalistic and condescending tone that minorities are just too stupid to figure out how to advocate for themselves, we say often it is the case that certain behaviors and parts of their life are disgusting. So the only way you could ever get someone to not think it is disgusting would be to normalize that type of behavior. You can't talk someone through why interracial marriage is acceptable. It is something that culturally changes over time because of the things that you see. But when it is the case that you walking out with your partner who is a different race than you is a political expression in of itself, we contend that you're unable to ever get that socialization and change. We got the idea from opening government, opening opposition that we can't figure out which consensus is better. What closing opposition brought you uniquely here is that once you reach a consensus, it never changes because the tools by which these groups are able to express themselves, they get locked out of. Shoot. So having said the dominant class controls the media and uses disgusting cases to rally their base, judges are more educated, more progressive, and listen to reason argument to set precedent. So isn't that why every single major civil rights victory was through the courts and not via your bizarre mechanism? Right, so let's be clear. The kind of court cases that existed in literally liberating groups of people didn't happen hundreds of years before they actually happened. 
That is to say that public sentiment about how you interpret laws and what you believe is right or wrong dramatically affect the way that people behave. That is to say that the people who control all aspects of media and happen to be the same race as the judges and happen to be the same sexual orientation and happen to have the capital and the connections because they went to the same goddamn law school, those are all structural advantages that you work to break down through socialization and changing the way that people perceive these cases. We say you just simply can't access that same level. Let's go through what we think we have left from closing government. We get this idea of whether or not there's a difference between like the loudspeakers, like protecting the public space, and maybe this is the sacred thing that you ought to prefer. Bobby gave you a crystal clear bright line on when you should prefer certain types of emotional harm and how you should weigh that emotional and physical harm. We say physical harm is on some degree of spectrum in the same way emotional harm is. So if I flipped Quan in the head, it doesn't dramatically change the way he's able to express his life. Bobby said the things that you should prefer and the harm you should prefer are ones that restrict people's ability to live their life. That is to say that someone who is particularly religious, feeling like this particular thing that I don't find acceptable is like, eh, not good, if you, even if you don't buy the temporal arguments, is not the same as someone not being able to walk out on the street and live their life. We think there's a tangible difference, and more importantly, an unresponded to one, about how we ought to interpret the state's competing interests there. They say it's democratically, but they never show to a quality of access. Go, close it. You may allow gay people to kiss in public. We protect you from seeing perverts, catcall, and masturbate in public. How can we resolve this outside the democratic will? Right. Here's how we ought adjudicate these types of claims. Part one, ensure that minority voices are protected, period. That is to say, having entrenched protections of allowing people to express themselves in certain ways, in the abstract, even if the utilitarian outcomes in a particular instance, like maybe it involves someone masturbating in a cart, fine. Then, once those protections are enshrined, which allow everyone equal access to any degree of society to advocate for themselves, then yes, maybe we'll try to find some kind of balancing degree there on things that make people comfortable. But we say that the important thing and the first order of business for any kind of state to be legitimate is to ensure that literally people can walk out of the street and be themselves. They try to run away from this debate, but recognize we're giving you reasons and explanation on like what types of things would actually get banned by discuss. It's either one of two things. This policy is meaningless, or that the structure of power would actually involve those who are at the top, those who are already powerful, and majoritarianism to effectively silence minority voices. The last thing to say is on this idea of like, okay then, how do you get change, right? Like not just like in the terms of rallying your own cause, but about changing literally other people's perspective, like how people interact with it, right? We argue that most people are not animalistic. They're not horrible, and they're not bigoted on towards minorities, right? It's a matter of education, and it's a matter of experiences. Bobby brings this to you literally not engaged with by closing government. That it is through these experiences and engagement that's the only way you'll ever change anyone's mind. It has to be seeing people who are different from you and doing different things from you, otherwise nothing will ever change. No one else in this debate brought you a concrete plan for how we move forward and how we redetermine consensuses that might exist within society. Listen. Discomfort is small, marginal, incredibly hard to communicate, but people's ability to live their lives is not. Always preference that. Incredibly proud of you.